Hey everybody, and welcome to episode three of my Activator's Guide series. So today we're gonna to take a look at actually choosing a place to activate, whether it's a park or a summit. We're gonna look at how to actually find a place to activate, some of the things you need to consider before you do that activation when it comes to site selection. Uh, so with that being said, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna hop into my computer here and we'll take a look at some of this stuff. Uh, so I'll be back in just a minute. Okay, so we're gonna start out here at my computer. Uh, a little later, we'll leave the shack and we'll take a look at some physical things, but I wanna start by actually talking about the websites you're gonna to go to actually look at different places to activate. So this is the Parks on the Air website. This is Poda.app. app. We're actually looking at my, my profile. So if we click on the hamburger, and I'm assuming by this point you've created an account for Parks on the Air and Summits on the Air. If you haven't done that yet, you're going to want to go ahead and do that. If you go back to episode one, I talk about the websites and, and how to actually go about uh, creating an account. So I'm going to click the little hamburger menu over here on the left-hand side. And you're going to see some options. And some of those options you're going to see are map and park list. All right, so... You can do this a couple of different ways. So we'll start with the map. So if I click map, it's gonna take me to a map of my area. So I live in the southern tier of New York, just near the Pennsylvania border, directly south of Syracuse. So we're looking at upstate New York and northern Pennsylvania right now. Uh, you can choose a different entity, a DX entity from up here. So if I wanna choose a different country, I can do that. If you wanna pick a specific state, province, region, so on and so forth, you can do that here. Okay, I'm going to leave it where we are right now, and we'll just take a look at some of the different parks that are in my area. So you can see there are quite a few parks, and if I zoom out, all right, you can see that there are a pile of parks. That's probably, uh, that's probably about an hour, 45 minutes north of me, 40, 40 minutes south of me, and probably an hour and a half, two hours in either direction, east and west. So there are quite a few parks. And all you've got to do to choose one of these, so we'll go, I'll go to my, my favorite watering hole, Oakley Corner State Forest. So we'll go ahead and we'll click this. You'll see that's Oakley Corner State Forest, which is Kilo 5221. <clears throat> all right, so that shows you where it is. If you want more information about the park, you click more info. And it will show you uh, the reference, the DXCC entity, what, where the lo what location it is. Now that, look, I'm sorry, what location it is. That may be multiple states, right? So um, the Appalachian Trail, for instance, runs all the way up the eastern seaboard. So that could be in many states, right? So some of these may be multiple states. It gives you latitude and longitude. It gives you your early shift and late shift time. So if you're going to do an early shift or a late shift activation, uh, it shows you what time you need to do, do those. Uh, if there's a website to the park, there will be one there. All right, so they won't all have them. So for instance, if I click this, that will take us to the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation's website for Oakley Corner State Forest, where I can get information about the state forest itself. Below that, it shows access methods. I can access this by automobile and foot. Now, some of it can be accessed by automobile, not all of it. Uh, activation methods, automobile, automobile or pedestrian, that's true. You can also access this particular place on mountain bike, on snowmobile. All right, so there are a couple of different options that have already been in here. It'll tell you whether it's an active park or not. In this case, it is active. It'll show you who the first activator was and what the date was for that activation. It'll show you how many uh, activations there have been and how many attempts there have been and how many QSOs there have been. You'll see this, is, this park's been activated quite a few times. This is the closest park to my area. So it gets activated a lot. You will see that I've activated here quite a bit lately. All right, it'll show you park leaders. So you'll see your, your different park leaders as far as how many activations they've done, the activator QSO leaders and the hunter QSO leaders. All right, so you can, you can see all those different things in there and it shows you the map here as well. So it just gives you a little bit of information about the, uh, about the, the park. And you can choose any park. So over here, if I pick this one, this is Shenango Valley State Park. All right, and it'll tell me the same thing. All right, we can go in here. It'll give us the same information, okay? So that's the map. Now, we can also look at a park list. So I can choose, so for instance, we can choose United States of America. If we scroll down here, because that's where I am. And then we can, I'm going to scroll down to New York, because that's, again, where I am. And this will give you a listing of every single park in the state of New York. Now, New York has 797 parks, I think. It has more parks than any other state in the country. It's kind of insane. 
this goes on for pages and pages and pages. Uh, but you can choose parks from here and you can filter. So if I wanted to filter, let's say by how many activations there have been. All right, we can, so there's only one in the entire state that's never been activated. There's a reason for that. You can't just go there. Uh, some of these have only been activated once. All right, if we wanted to see the most activated one, I could cl click that again and you'll see the Appalachian Trail is the most activated with 2,191 activations, 80,453 QSOs, all right? I've hunted it nine times and it tells you it goes through 13 states. So like I said, some of these will go through multiple states. So you can look at this list any number of different ways. Uh, you can filter by location, by grid square, by how many attempts have been made to activate, by how many activations there are, by QSOs, by how many times I've activated it. So if I click that, I can see how many times I've activated a specific park, all right, how many times I've hunted it. You can search for a park by just typing a park number up in here. So we'll go K2023. Oops, I gotta put a hyphen in there. All right, you'll see that's Buttermilk Falls State Park, which is the last park I just activated. All right, so you can look at parks a number of different ways on the Parks on the Air website to find uh, a park to activate. I usually use the map. It's a lot easier to kind of scroll around the map and see where things are. You can actually physically see where they are on the map. So, for instance, here, here's Buttermilk Falls State Park, which is the one we just looked at. All right, and that's the last park I activated. And if I click more info, you'll see the last person to activate it was me last weekend, okay? So uh, that kind of gives you an idea as to how to find parks for parks on the air. Now we're gonna look at the actual site for activation in a little bit, but I do wanna hop over to Summits on the Air and show you that as well. And then we'll get to the map and we'll kind of look at some of the things you need to keep in mind when you choose a place to activate. So with that being said, let's hop over to Summits on the Air. Okay, so let's take a look at Summits on the Air now. So <clears throat> SOTA is gonna be a little bit different. Uh, a lot of it's gonna be the same, but there are some more specifics you need to think about. So I'm on the soda.org.uk website, and you can see we've got Summit listings and mapping. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna click Summit listings first. Actually, let me open that in a separate tab. Hold on, let's do this. Open it in two tab. Okay, so this will give you a listing by association name. Uh, so Bouvet Island and Montenegro and so on and so forth. So I'm gonna scroll down until I find US, which is gonna be W, and I am in W2, which is where New York is. So I'm gonna go ahead and click W2. And let's pick the Greater Catskills. I'm actually in Western New York, but let's go ahead and pick the Greater Catskills. So this is gonna give me a summit listing of every summit in the Greater Catskills. All right, there are a lot of them. So let's take a look at Overlook Mountain, which is one that I've activated. So this gives us a lot of different information. We can get a lot of different mapping information from up here, whole bunch of different ways to do it. And we'll talk about some of these in a minute. Uh, it'll, there's a lot of resources down here, so different articles and things that have been written by other people about this particular summit, okay? Uh, we can also look at the mapping. So if I click this, this will give us a summit in the air map where I can choose my association. So again, we'll go, I'm W2. So I will scroll down to W2. And then I can choose a region. So let's do Greater Catskills again. All right, now I know that I am summit, I want summit 112, uh, which is, we look mountain all right so there it is and that's not very good on this particular there we go and it'll bring up a card with information about the summit uh it'll show you where it is the locator all that kind of stuff and if we click it it's going to take us directly to the same page that we were just on okay with all the information for that particular summit so the idea is the same uh, it's very similar to parks in the air it's going to give you a little blurb about it and if you click the link it's going to take you directly to that particular summit you'll see the map is a little bit more cluttered uh, if you look it's kind of hard to make out some of these su summits unless you zoom in quite a ways where it starts to separate them out all right so we can pick individual summits you'll notice that it'll give you how many points those summits are so how many times they've been activated all those kind of things all right, uh, you can see right here, Overlook Mountain has been activated 58 times, okay? Uh, it's a four-point summit. 
It's got a three point uh, winter bonus. So if you activate it during the winter, it's worth seven points instead of four. The other thing that you can use is something called Sotlis, uh, which is kind of like the Soda Atlas. It's Sotla dot S O T L dot A S slash map. All right, and I'll. This is in the the guide that I have uh, written up for this. But this does a nicer job of making it kind of look a little bit more uh, friendly. Okay, so we'll pick. We'll just pick a random uh, mountain. So let's pick. Let's pick this guy right here. That's gonna be a hot ten point mountain. So that's Blackhead Mountain. All right. So that is three thousand nine hundred and fifty feet. It's a ten point summit with a three point uh, winter bonus. It's been activated forty three times. It was last activated July 1st, 2023. There's the activator. If I click more, it will take us to a page that will give us information about the particular summit. Uh, Wiki Wikipedia articles, uh, Google Maps, different articles. It'll give you a map of where that particular uh, summit is located. If you scroll down, it'll show you all the different logged activations, how many QSOs per band, how many activations per year, how many activations per month. This is actually a really nice website and it gives you a lot of really good information about a particular summit. Uh, I prefer this to the actual summits on the AIR website. This I find this to be a lot uh, neater, a lot nicer, a lot easier to use. The soda one is okay. This one is much much cleaner, much nicer. Whoever designed this did a really good job. Uh, so this is, this is the way I normally find summits when I'm doing summits on the AIR. Uh, Either way works. I, like I said, I just find that this is a little a little nicer to use, right? So if I want to pick any particular summit, we can pick any one. We'll pick a lower one. So here's a here's a one point summit. All right. Now a lot of these summits will not be accessible easily. They'll be on uh, private property. A lot of these will be. But again, it gives you information about the particular summit. Right, so we'll click that guy right there. That's Hunter. All right. That's Hunter Mountain. And Hunter Mountain is a 10 point. Again, it's 4,049 feet. It's been activated 50 times. I want to activate Hunter. I, I've been to Hunter before, but I've never activated the summit. I've never been all the way to the true summit. So at any rate, uh, I kind of like this particular website for summits on the air. Uh, I, I Like I said, I just find it a little neater, a little cleaner, and there's a lot of information on these pages. So lots of good information about the, the summit, different activation write-ups. Like I said, a lot of data about that particular. I mean, there's there's one of Chris's videos on, in fact, that's a really good video if you watch that video on uh, on YouTube. He actually attaches his NFED to the uh, fire tower to use it as an antenna mast. <laughs> so at any rate, like I said, there's a lot of really good information on this website. So that's kind of how I locate summits for summits in the air. Now let's take a look at, we'll look at Google Maps and we'll actually take a look at some of the things you need to keep in mind when you pick a place to activate. So let me hop over to Google Maps and uh, you'll see what I mean. So I'll be right back. Okay, so we're on Google Maps now and I'm looking at Chimney Bluff State Park, which is a park that I've activated before. This is not a terribly big park, but I want to show you some of the things you might want to consider when you look for a park to activate. So this is the whole park. It's not a very big park. Okay, it... it there's not a whole lot going on here other than the bluffs, which are really cool. If you watch my video on those, you'll see how neat that looks. And there are some trails that run through here. But you, you could activate any place inside the park. So one of the things you need to understand with parks on the air is that every piece of equipment that you're using has to be within the boundaries of the park. Okay, so you're, if you're operating from a vehicle, the vehicle needs to be in the park. Your entire antenna needs to be in the park. All of the components of your station need to be within the boundaries of the park. So that's something you need to keep in mind. So you're going to need to know where those park boundaries are. But if I zoom in, all right, you can see, if I keep going, so this is, this is where I activated from. All right, so this is the beach. Uh, this picnic table right here is the picnic table that I activated from and it's on a it's on a concrete pad it's up oh I don't know a little ways from the water but you can see that we've got a lot of green open space 
We've got some picnic tables that are kind of spread out. There's some benches down near the water. I almost, there's a picnic table right here I almost used, but it was too close to the water. It was awfully loud. It's very windy up there and the water, there were, there were white caps on the lake that day. I mean, this is on Lake Ontario. It's like being on the ocean. So I wanted to move back a little bit away from the, uh, away from the, the lake. So it'd be a little quieter. But you could activate any place in here. Now, this is nice because it's wide open. There's a lot of space between the picnic tables, so you're probably not going to be in any, anybody else's way. Now, I went on a day when the weather wasn't all that great, and it was the middle of the week, so there was hardly anybody there. But you can see you can't drive down here. You have to walk down in. This, road, this is not a road. This is a path. Now, I finished my activation, actually, way up here. So there's actually, you can't see it, but underneath this tree is another... Uh, pick the table where I finished my activation. And this is the parking area. So you park up here and then you walk in. So that's something you need to consider, right? If you need to be able to drive up and activate, you could do that here. You could do it right from this parking lot because this parking lot is completely within the bounds of the, the park itself, all right? Or you can hike down in and I could activate anywhere in here. If I chose to, I could have walked all the way out to the bluffs, which I did, and I could have set up way over here on the trail overlooking these bluffs all right and as long as you're inside the park it doesn't matter but you do need to consider what kind of things do you need at your activation zone all right so for instance here right i've got i've got uh picnic tables we've got open space all right we've got um there's bat. There's public bathrooms here. That's something you might want to consider, right? Uh, is there access to things like restrooms? If is there shelter? Those kind of things. Uh, shelter may be an issue. We're going to talk later in the episode about weather, and that's one of the things that you need to keep in mind is that you may need some shelter. All right, and you're, the the kind of shelter you need may depend entirely on you and what you're bringing with you and what the weather conditions are going to be like. Uh, so like I said, you may have site requirements like pav pavilions or picnic tables. Do you need trees to put antennas up? Right now, this park, they don't generally want you putting things in the trees, but if I wanted to, I could have strung an antenna up into one of these trees, no problem. Um, like I said, do you need trails to walk down? This place has got trails, restrooms, that kind of stuff. Those are all going to depend on you and where you're activating. So uh, this <laughs> mess, and you can't really tell, but this is a dirt road that runs into Oakley Corner State Forest, which is my most activated park. So if I zoom out, and that star is where there's like a camping spot, you drive in, you can drive in from the road here, you drive down in, and this dirt road is pretty rough. You wouldn't want to probably drive down it in Grandma's minivan. And you can't really see, but this is sort of an open dirt area. I activate right up in here under these trees. Right, I'm in the middle of nowhere. There is no bathrooms, no shelter, there's no picnic tables, no nothing. So I have to bring everything with me that I'm gonna need. If I need shelter, I've gotta bring it with me. If I need a table, I've gotta bring it with me. All of those things have to come with me. So if you're activating a place like this, keep that in mind, right? This you can drive to, but it's pretty rough to get in there. And then you've gotta log all your stuff into the woods to set up. And there's no amenities. You are in a forest in the middle of the woods, in the middle of nowhere, there's no nothing, okay? So, that's something to consider. Now, I like to do activations way out in the middle of nowhere. Some of the activations I've done, uh, I'm so far out. So I'll give you a for instance. So like, where's, let's see. Let's go to Jenksville. So Jenksville State Forest. So I've activated this many times. And in fact, the one where I broke my antenna was way, way, way out in this area out here. All right. And there's absolutely nothing. I mean, it's like multiple miles back to the parking lot and you're hiking down trails. There's no amenities. There's no nothing. You're in the middle of nowhere. So you've got to keep that in mind. Right. You've got to bring everything with you. <clears throat> now, this this is Sugar Hill State Forest and this is the Sugar Hill Fire Tower. I've activated here multiple times, too. Now, the interesting thing about this. So this is a drive up park. You can drive. Well, Depends on the time of year. If it is October to April, you have to park down at the base of the road here and walk in. Uh, during the spring, summer, and fall months, you can drive right up this dirt road and drive directly up to this parking area 
here's the fire tower. And if you look around the fire tower, it's kind of hard to see, but there are all sorts of picnic tables in here. That's a pavilion you can go into, okay? There's the fire tower you can go into. This is a big restroom. Like, this is a really nice bathroom area. There's uh, running water, the whole nine. These are all campsites down here. So this is a great place to activate. Lots of space. You're way up on a hill. Now, the other cool thing about this is not only is it a park, it's also a summit. So if you activate from here, it's a twofer. You can activate both parks on the air and summits on the air, okay? So that's this is a great place. And again, just take a look at the map. Before you activate a place, just hop on Google Maps and zoom in and see what's there, right? If you need picnic tables, there's all sorts of tables. If you need access to bathrooms or running water, they're all there, right? If you're maybe somebody who has limited mobility and you want to be able to have a drive up activation, make sure it's someplace you can drive into, right? So here I can drive right in. I can operate from my vehicle. Now, I've also activated from down the trail down here, these lean-tos. These you cannot drive to. This is kind of a hike in. So there's a lean-to here and a lean-to here. And if you watch my One Sugar Hill State Forest video, I'm activating from this lean-to right here. It's it's a hike down in there. It's not super far, but it's not right next to the car either. Uh, so again, here I've at least got shelter, right? I've got I've got a, a lean-to and there's a, a picnic table. Uh, and there is, right here is a, an outhouse, so there's technically a bathroom. So this one's got a little more amenities than my, my normal spot at Oakley Corner State Forest. But again, it's way out in the middle of nowhere, so that's something to consider. Now here, this is Overlook Mountain. So Overlook is a long hike up. So let me zoom down here. So the parking area for Overlook Mountain is way down here, and it is a long hike up this mountain. You can't drive in. You have to hike in. There's the Overlook Mountain House Ruins, which is a really cool spot. If you watch my video on that, you'll see what I mean. And the fire tower is way up here at the top, okay? And... This is not for the faint of heart. You're not going to come up here if you don't have, if you're not in good shape, you probably don't want to hike up here. But once you're up here, it's amazing. There's pic there's a couple picnic tables. There's the fire tower. The overlook itself is over here off of these rocks, and the, the view is spectacular. Uh, but again, you're up on top of a mountain, so you've got limited resources up here. There is a, a, an outhouse, but there's not really anything else up here. So you're going to have to haul all the water you need up there any food, all your radio gear, and it's a multi-mile hike up the mountain. It's not an easy hike, but it is a really cool place to activate. Now, one thing you've got to understand with summits in the air, unlike parks on the air, where as long as you're within the park boundaries, you're good, summits have activation zones. So this is the activation zone for Overlook Mountain. So you can see we've got this sort of funky shaped outline. If you're inside that outline, that is the activation zone. Okay, so this is the fire tower right here. Zoom in a little bit. All right, so there's the fire tower itself. That's the picnic table I activated from when I was up there. All right, uh, there's some buildings. That's the outhouse. All right, uh, the all of this stuff is within the activation zone. So like here's that overlook I was talking about. It's a cliff. Uh, and that's within the activation zone. So as long as you're within the, your whole station needs to be within that activation zone and no portion of your station can be touching a vehicle and you have to be powered by something other than fossil fuels. So you can't have a generator or be running off a car's alternator. You have to be battery powered, something solar powered, something like that. And you have to be completely within this activation zone. As long as your station is within the activation zone, you're good to go. Now this is activation.zone. Again, I'll put links to all these things in, in my, my activator's guide document that I'll post with the video. Uh, but this is where you want you, you probably want to go to check to make sure you're actually going to be within the activation zone. Make sure where you're planning on activating is within this activation zone, right? Don't think you're going to set up, for instance, at the Overlook Mountain House ruins, which are down here, which are really cool, and that'd be a cool place to activate. There's your there's your ruins. Okay. That's not in the activation zone. So if you're going to do a summit activation, you need to be within here. Now, Overlook Mountain is also a park. So if you wanted to do the park activation and not the summit activation, you absolutely could activate from the Mountain House Ruins. Okay, But because I did a dual park and summit activation, I activated from within the summit activation zone. So it was a valid park activation and a valid summit activation. And this just gives you some information about where it is. It gives you the reference. So this is W2, Greater Catskills, 
Summit 112, it's Overlook Mountain. Gives your latitude, longitude, your altitude, meters. All right, those kind of things. So this is a handy reference to use also. Now, not all summits are going to be this hard to get to. So this, this is Mount Unseanta. I think I'm pronouncing that right, which I activated not that long ago. This is a drive up summit. You can drive right up this tower road. You can drive directly to the summit. And the view from up here is spectacular. It looks kind of crappy in this uh, Google Maps image because there's all these trucks up here working on the cell towers. But there's the fire tower. That's the picnic table I activated from. That's the old observatory. This is where the spectacular views are from. There's a bench right here that overlooks the valley, and it's amazing. But you can literally drive right up. I parked here, and the picnic table was here. I was 20 feet from the picnic table. Okay, so if you're somebody who wants to be able to drive up and do an activation, this is a drive up summit. You drive right up. You can you can you don't even need to get out of your vehicle. You act you could activate from this parking area from your vehicle. Well, no, you can't. I lied. You can't be in the vehicle for a, for a summit activation. So you'd have to get out of your vehicle and set up someplace other than the vehicle. But you could walk 10 feet to 15 feet from your vehicle parked here, walk up to that picnic table and activate. Okay. So like I said, if it's a park, you can do it from within your vehicle. If it's a summit, your entire station has to be outside of your vehicle. Now, not all these peaks are going to be that easy to get to. So here's Mount Marcy, which is the highest peak in New York, up in, up in the... Uh, the high peaks of the Adirondacks. You're not going to activate this unless you're in good shape and you're willing to hike for a long time. All right, this is a long hike. I think it's like 14 miles, something like that. And it's, you're way up in the middle of nowhere, okay? So if I zoom out, you can see there's nothing anywhere nearby other than other mountains. There's no roads, there's no buildings, there's no nothing. So if you're going to activate a summit like this, it's going to take some planning. You need to bring everything with you. You need to have emergency stuff with you. You need to be in good enough physical condition to be able to make the hike, right? All of those kind of things. You're going to see when we talk about some of these things, your physical abilities are going to play a big role in this, right? If you can't do that hike, don't attempt it, all right? Make sure you're prepared. If you're going to go on a long hike like this and activate some of these summits, make sure you're prepared. You might get stuck up there overnight. Right, so make sure you've got stuff with you, food, water, shelter, emergency gear, first aid gear, comms other than ham radio, right, so that you can get yourself out of a situation if you end up in one. But like I said, if you're, if you're operating someplace like up here, there's nothing except for rocks and plants. You're in the middle of nowhere all by yourself, all right? So um, that kind of gives you an idea about, as to how I choose an activation site, the things I look for. Uh, so when I come back, We'll be out of the shack and we'll talk about some of the other things that you need to consider when you look at doing an activation. So we'll be back in just a minute. So thanks to the power of editing, <clears throat> we're no longer in my shack. We are now at a park. Now this particular park is not a Parks on the Air park. Uh, I'm at Round Top Park in Endicott, New York. And I just figured I'd hop up here to kind of show you some of the things you might want to think about when you look at an activation spot. Uh, there are certain things that I look for. Uh, they may be different than the things you look for. So I just kind of want to talk about some of the different aspects that people might be concerned with. So here, um, we've got a number of different things we can we can deal with. So first things first, we've got bathrooms, right? That may or may not be something you need. Uh, you know, if you need if you need bathrooms available to you, that's something to consider. This particular park has a little playground. Right, so if you've got your kids with you, that might keep them busy. <clears throat> there are also two pavilions here. There are picnic tables all over the place up here. Right, there's a picnic table there, there's picnic tables over there, down across the road. There's picnic tables all down through there. There's picnic tables down here. So those are some of the things you know you might you might want to look at when you're looking for an activation spot. Uh, one thing with pavilions is a lot of times these will be reserved. Now it is a crappy, cold, rainy, cloudy October day here. So there are no, <laughs> no reservations for these pavilions. But in the summer, these things will be reserved like every day. Okay, so there are two of them here. So that's something you'd need to consider. Now again, like I said, this is not a park you can activate. This is not a state park or a uh, state forest or anything like that. This is a county park. So I just came up here to kind of you know, give you, give you some things you might want to think about. So I've got my cheat sheet with me again. We, we already talked about, you know, Podadot app, 
and the soda website and all those different things. We talked a little bit about some of the site selection things you might want to consider using a mapping program to look at what's available before you even go there. Like I said, site requirements. Do you need something like a pavilion that I'm in right now? Do you need picnic tables? Right? What's the terrain like? We talked about that, right? If it's really steep, are you physically capable of making it to the activation site? Can you drive up? If you can drive up, is the road something you can drive your regular car up or do you need a truck or a, or a high clearance vehicle or something? You know, what are your physical abilities? Like I said, how capable is your vehicle? Will dense foliage be an issue? Will no foliage be an issue, right? Both of those things could be a problem. If you've got dense foliage, <clears throat> it could be a problem trying to get antennas up in the air. Um, you know, if I went back down into the woods back there, it's very thick. Could I get an antenna up? Probably. Would it be easy? Not particularly. Conversely, if you set up someplace like one of these picnic tables out here and it's sunny and 95 degrees, right? You're going to bake. So, you know, you might need shade. You might need shelter. If it's going to be a rainy, crappy day, you might need some shelter. If it's going to be super hot, you might need some shade. And if you're going someplace where there's no trees, no pavilions, no nothing, and you're going to be out in the sun, that could be an issue. You might want to consider bringing some shelter with you, either like a pop-up awning, or I always have a poncho in my pack and a ridge line. I can set a, a tarp up in you know a minute or two and have shelter. So that's something to consider. Do you need to bring shelter with you? I always do, regardless of where I'm going. But that might be something you want to consider, right? Is do you need shade because there may be places where you go where there isn't any and like i said conversely if you go someplace where it's super super thick dense foliage you may have a hard time getting an antenna up all right um <clears throat> now the weather the weather is going to be another big issue okay so like i said are we going to mount washington or the beach in florida <laughs> those are going to be very different situations and it's going to be very different situations depending on the time of the year but mount washington in july uh, it probably is going to be okay, although the weather up there can get insane. Mount Washington in January, there's a 0% chance you want to be up there. Florida, like I said, if you're on the beach in Florida, man, it's probably going to be nice. Unless it's hurricane season, right? That's something to keep in mind, too. So weather is going to be time of year dependent, right? Up here in upstate New York, it in a couple of months, this is going to be just feet of snow. You, you won't be able to see anything. It'll just be a blanket of snow. I don't want to be sitting out here in 10 degree weather in two feet of snow trying to do an activation, right? If you go up to the Adirondacks in October, you climb one of those peaks. We just talked about Mount Marcy. You might get to the top of Mount Marcy. It might be 55 degrees and sunny at the bottom of the mountain. It might be 25 degrees, 30 degrees and snow at the top of the mountain. So that's something to consider as well, right? Terrain is going to greatly affect uh, weather, time of year is greatly going to affect the weather, right? So like I said, snow season, monsoon season. If you're someplace where you get a rainy season, you know, that's that's something you really got to think about is do you want to be caught out in a huge torrential rainstorm? Are you prepared to be caught out in a huge torrential rainstorm? Keep in mind, a lot of this radio equipment doesn't really enjoy being wet. Severe thunderstorms and tornadoes. I mean, around here in the spring, pop-up severe thunderstorms are super common. If you live in Tornado Alley, I apologize for the leg of my camera here, but it's kind of in the frame and there's not much I can do about it. Um, if you live in Tornado Alley, oh, that's a little better. That's something you really need to consider, right? I mean, do you want to be caught out in that kind of stuff? Uh, you know, hurricane season, like I said, if you're someplace like Florida or Puerto Rico or, you know, the Gulf Coast of Texas or, or Louisiana or those kind of places, you know, Alabama, Mississippi, or even up the East Coast, Hurricanes can be an issue. Even if you're not directly impacted by it, it can throw a wrench in the works. Fire season. I mean, this season here, uh, we, here in New York State, there was so much smoke, it looked like it was nighttime during the day in June. It was insane, right? And we're not, I'm not even someplace where we get wildfires. You know, if you live out west, someplace where you get wildfires all the time, that's definitely something you need to keep, keep in mind. The geography is going to play a role in this one, too. Right, so hills, mountains, large bodies of water, they can all affect weather greatly. Right, depending on whether you're on one side of mountains or the other, it can be the difference between you know heavy rain or heavy snow and nothing. Uh, 
you know, those kind of things really need to be taken into consideration when you're planning your activation, not just where you're going to activate, but when you're going to activate. Altitude, obviously going to play a, a, a role in that, right? Um, obviously, the higher we go in altitude, the colder it's going to get. So, for instance, I was on top of Mount Tahiti in Spain, well, in the Canary Islands, uh, in July, and it was 80 degrees at the base of the mountain, and it was 30 at the top of the mountain. Right? That's, I don't know, about 12,000 feet elevation change. That's a big difference. So, you know, plan accordingly. If you're going to be doing a summit that's, you know, you're, if you're out west and you're doing like one of the 14ers or something, it is going to be cold at the top of that mountain. Keep that in mind. Even in July or August, that's going to be cold. And like I said, shelter. Do you need it? Do you need sun protection? Do you need rain protection? Do you need wind protection? I always bring something with me. Like I said, I always have a poncho with me that I can set up as a tarp if I need to. Uh, a poncho is nice because it's multi-use. I can set it up as a shelter or I can wear it. But those are things that you really need to keep in mind. So, you know, shelter is one of those things that you don't think about until you need it. Now, if you're setting up someplace like this where I'm in a pavilion, it's not really a big deal. But in a lot of places I go to, there is nothing other than trees. And you might need some sort of shelter to set up. So keep that in mind as well. Make sure you've got the shelter. Make sure you know how to set it up. Don't think that the first time you're going to use it is the first time you're going to set it up. Practice that stuff ahead of time because it can be a little fidgety. And if you're not used to setting those things up, you know, like when I set a ridge line up, I've done it a thousand times. I can try to tie a trucker's hitch with my eyes closed. But if you've never done it and the, a storm rolls in, that's not the time to learn how to do that stuff. Safety, physical dangers, wildlife, things like that. Are there cliffs? So we just talked about Overlook Mountain. The one of the, Within the activation zone, there's a cliff. You can activate right on that cliff and don't fall off that cliff or you're going to be in trouble, right? Rock falls. Is there a potential of having a rock fall or a mudslide or an avalanche or wildfires? We talked about wildfires. Like I said, those kind of physical dangers are things you need to consider. I mean, a fall from a cliff, even if it's a short cliff, is going to ruin your weekend. Um, you know, a rock fall or an avalanche, they'll kill you in a hurry. So you really need to plan those things accordingly. Pay attention to where you're setting up, okay? Okay. Um, Things like Widowmakers. So I've talked about this before. In fact, my activation at um, Jenksville State Forest where I had a tree branch fall on my antenna, right? It broke my antenna. If that fell on my head, I'd have had a problem. When I set up a shelter in the woods, I always, one of the first things I do is look up in the air at the trees and see, are there any big dead branches or are there any big dead trees around me? Because in the middle of the night, if a storm blows in or something happens and one of those big tree branches or trees falls on me, I'm in trouble. Do the same thing when you're setting up for an activation. Pay attention to things like Widowmakers. Pay attention to things like, the you know, do you have anything to block the wind? All those kind of things. Wildlife, all right? There may be wildlife you have to be worried about. Bears. And I've got bears around here. They're, they're black bears, so it's not really an issue. But they're out there, and you definitely don't want to be, get between mama bear and her cubs, right? Big cats, mountain lions, things like that. Um, DEC says there's no mountain lions here. I promise you there are, right? Skunks, snakes. When I was up in Overlook Mountain, if you watch that video, you'll see I ran into a huge timber rattler, all right? Spiders, scorpions, aliens. You never know, man. <laughs> Critters of the two-legged variety, right? People can be some of the most dangerous animals out there. Make sure you're paying attention to who's around you. Be aware of your surroundings. I'm not saying, you know, you need to be super psycho about this stuff, but you never know. You, you know, depending on where you are, depending on where that park is and how remote you are, you might run into some people that you might not want to run into. So pay attention to those kind of things as well. And I'm not going to get into trying to uh, mitigate issues with things like that. That's out of the scope of this video, right? Trying to deal with bears or coyotes or wolves or people or big cats, any of those kind of things. But those are things you definitely need to keep in mind when you go out to an activation site is, are, do I need to pay attention to, am I getting eaten by a bear? <laughs> okay. Public interaction with the station. So this is something that you're really going to want to consider because there is a distinct possibility that you're going to run into people when you're out. Even if you're in the middle of nowhere, you might run into people. All right. So I'm, I'm actually on the move here. I'm, I'm going to walk back down to my truck because it, it didn't occur to me until just now, but there's something in my truck that I kind of want to talk about. It's on this sheet. Um, so are you operating in a very public area, like a high traffic area? If you are, keep in mind that antenna placement, we talked about this uh, when we talked about antennas, antenna placement might be an issue. You might need to pay attention to guy lines for antennas, radials for your antennas, those kind of things, right? 
they could very easily cause problems with foot traffic. Um, coax, right? That's another thing that people are going to step on your coax. Watch those kind of things. Are people going to be pestering you about what you're doing? Now, I've had people ask me what I'm doing in the past, and normally they're just curious. I've had uh, DEC officers and park rangers and just general passers by ask me. Every once in a while, I have somebody who, run, who, who runs across me who asks what I'm doing and they're like, oh, are you doing a POTA activation or a soda activation? They know what it is. But more often than not, when you interact with the uh, public, they're probably not gonna understand what you're doing. So one of the things that I like to do, let me put my sheet down here for a second. So one of the things that I like to do is I bring with me I have these trifolds. You can print these out. These are on the POTA website. These are on the SOTA website. Okay, and I keep these. I keep a couple of these with me in my pack all the time. And if somebody's got questions, I can just hand them one of these and explains. So here's parks in the air. It explains about what parks on the air is, about the ARRL, what a typical station looks like. All right, all of those kinds of things. What amateur radio is. The summits on the air one is very similar. Same idea. It's got a link to the website. Talks about what summits on the air is. All right. Um, it talks about the different awards and things and the activity alerts and is it popular or not and links and all those kind of things. Just some general information to the programs. So if someone does have a, a question, it's easy to answer. I've handed, I've handed DEC officers these before when they've asked me questions like, hey, what are you doing? I hand them one of these. They're like, oh, cool. Uh, usually they're pretty interested in it when you, uh, once you tell them what you're doing, they're, they're kind of curious. So it's not a bad idea to have something with you where you can explain to the general public, look, this is what I'm doing. Some people will actually put signs up. So if they're activating, let's say in a pavilion, like where I just was up here, they might have a sign or a flag up that says what they're doing, just to kind of give people a, an understanding of what they're walking into. But like I said, pay attention to that stuff. A lot of times what I'll do is I will carry surveyor's tape with me. Uh, I carry a, either a roll of surveyor's tape or I'll just rip off you know, a few feet. And I'll tie that around things like radials or coax on the ground. Or if I've got, let's suppose I'm stringing up an antenna between these trees here and I've got guy lines. All right, so if I'm going, let's say from that branch up there down to this tree over here and this tree over here, I might put surveyor's tape around the guy lines if I'm putting up a dipole or something so that people don't run into it uh, because they will. Even with bright colored rope, they will. So if you put, you know, either caution tape or surveyor's tape or something that's bright and obvious, they're a lot less likely to run into it. Um, so that's one of the things that I, I generally do to mitigate that issue. Now, the last thing we need to consider are things like nearby sources of QRM. Do you need a filter? You might need a broadcast filter. You know, you may be activating someplace where you might be in close proximity to something like an AM radio tower or cell towers. A lot of times when I go up to summits, in fact, every one of them, there are cell towers on them because they're high, right? And I want to get those cell towers up high, just like I want to get my antenna up high. So you'll run into situations where you may run into issues with QRM. So that is something you absolutely need to consider. And the reason I'm walking is when I round the corner here, like I said, you want to talk about QRM? There's a cell tower right on top of me. And then this is covered in antennas. This is the Repeat, this is a, there's a repeater here. They, all of the uh, police department and local fire department have antennas on here, right? All that stuff could potentially wreak havoc with your station. There is a big generator right here. If that thing's on, it is gonna cause issues with your station, right? So keep those kind of things in mind. Are there things nearby, things like broadcast stations, cell towers, power lines, electric cars? Uh, I've run into this one where you are in a parking lot or next to a parking lot, somebody rolls up in an electric car, they will generate all sorts of crazy QRM. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Now, a lot of times, like I said, when I'm doing my activations quite often, I am way out in the middle of nowhere and that's a non-issue. But like I said, on top of a summit, there's probably gonna be cell towers. They may or may not cause issues. I generally haven't had issues with cell towers, but some people have. Right, broadcast radio stations, they can definitely cause issues. If I walk over this way, I'm gonna go over to, there's a lookout over here that looks out over the valley, and we'll be able to see multiple AM broadcast stations from here. They could cause you issues. And keep in mind that some radios are gonna be more 
susceptible to uh, interference from broadcast stations, right? So if you're using, I don't want to pick on anybody in particular, but like a Shegu 6100, they're notorious for overloading near, uh, you know, powerful broadcast stations and things like that. Any radio could be susceptible to it. Some are worse than others. So that's also something you need to consider. So when you're looking at site selection, those are all things you need to keep in mind. You know, don't just go, oh, I'm gonna go to this place and then go and show up and go, oh man, there's no shelter. Or, oh man, I can't get there because the road is closed and I have to hike five miles in. Or, oh man, there's an AM broadcast station right next to me and it's causing all sorts of QRM, right? Or, holy cow, look, there's a bear. <laughs> so, you know, those are some of the things you really need to think about. Uh, and I don't know if you can see it or not, you probably won't be able to see it on camera. But right in between these trees here, there are five, you won't be able to see them on the camera, there are five AM broadcast antennas right there. And way down the valley down here, there's a whole slew of them out on the hill over there. They're probably far enough away, they're not gonna cause any issues. Uh, but if you were up close to them, I promise you they would. So, like I said, I will link this document in the description below. You can go down through, I will, these will be physical links. So when this is posted, you'll be able to click these and go to Poda.app, the soda website, soda list, those kind of things. Those will be physical links. And then, like I said, these are all different things that you really need to think about before you go out into your activation. So check your map first, find the place to activate. Actually hop on like Google Maps, see what's there. Pay attention to, you know, if you need shelter, those kind of things, make sure that's there. Uh, like I said, if you have specific site requirements, make sure those are there before you go any further. What's the terrain like? Like I, like I said, if you don't have the physical ability to hike up there, make sure that you don't pick some place where you gotta walk five miles in. You know, if you need trees to set up in, make sure they're there. Pay attention to what the weather's gonna be like, right? Like I said, Mount Washington, even in July, can get ugly. Physical safety. Pay attention to things like cliffs, rock falls, avalanches, all those kinds of things. Public interaction with your station, be it just the general public, like people walking around, or it could be the police, it could be, like I said, rangers, things like that. And then finally, think about nearby sources of QRM, you know, broadcast stations, cell towers, other RFI inducing equipment like electric cars, power lines, all those kind of things. So, with that being said, in our next video, we'll be looking at actually preparing for the activation. So we'll look at uh, some of the setup involved in actually setting up our gear, uh, we'll talk about uh, those kind of things, and then we'll get out and we'll actually do the activation itself. So we'll, you've seen in the videos, and if you've never done an activation, it's pretty straightforward, but you've seen in my videos how they go, but we'll, we'll walk through it step by step so that you can kind of get a feel for exactly what you need to do once you're actually at the activation site. So with that being said, I really appreciate everybody watching. Uh, if you've got any comments or questions or anything, leave them in the comment section below. Uh, otherwise, I will see you on the next episode. Like I said, the next episode will be where we're actually preparing to do our activation. So with that being said, until the next one, thanks for watching. 7-3.